we have it as an entrepreneur turned investor who is not only known for being a successful businessman but uh, and a venture ca capitalist but also his views on technology and investment mr vinod kosla founder of kosla ventures um, he will take us through his journey of giving uh, in the session which is called uh, philanthropy for a uh, sustainable world uh, we also have uh, mr rob robert rossin director at bill, uh, bill and melinda gates foundation uh, driving this fireside chat um rob is the director of uh, philanthropic partnerships um in his role robert leads a team that oversees the foundation's relationship with philanthropists and charitable organizations across the globe uh previously ross um, sorry rossin also served as the director of foundation's executive office and various roles in communication over to you rob great thank you so much uh good evening and i'm i'm delighted to be here uh with all of you and and with vinod um so i look forward to uh, this conversation and we'll make sure to get some participation from the audience of vinod but uh has really done so many extraordinary things as a founder uh at sun microsystems um and then as a venture capitalist and technologist uh uh most recently with with coastal ventures but also you know a a real driver of innovation and thinking on a number of issues that are critical to society so want to make sure we're able to uh elicit as much uh, from him as as possible so I'll, I'll keep the introduction brief and and turn it over to Vinod and and maybe just to start um covid-19 has has certainly touched every part of the world and all of us in some way so let me uh begin uh by welcoming you and just asking uh how you and and your family are are doing through this uh extraordinary situation robert uh and hello everybody it's great to have everybody here uh me and my family are doing great uh it makes us realize how lucky we are to be able to quarantine ourselves even hide away and it actually really has highlighted the role of inequality for me and the level of fragility we have in the world so um, some good to come out of it it's dramatically increased my sensitivity though to those issues of inequality uh and unequal access to all the facilities uh as well as the fragility of the world. Yeah, build, building on that a bit and you've worn, you know, many different hats uh in in your professional experience as a as a company founder and leader, as an investor, as a philanthropist and just, you know, as we get into this question of of inequality and we'll talk a bit about inclusive development. and i'd love to hear where you see some similarities in terms of how you might approach any particular issue with the the different perspectives that you've had you know in terms of a business leader uh investor and philanthropist are there are they the same or or are there differences in how you might think about driving meaningful change so uh there are the similarities then there all are differences I think fundamentally in philanthropy we have to start with what to care about and empathy empathy for the less advantaged I like to say the bottom half of the people on the planet is one of the most important factors uh, having said that uh deciding what to work on Uh, is much more of a business decision um uh, it's really efficacy and efficiency in what uh, whatever you decide to work on so empathy plays a large role in what to work on uh or to care uh ef- efficacy and e- efficiency which are very business like terms play a large role in how to do it and how to even pick what item to work on there's also related issues like how do you measure the effect you're having just working in an area is probably not good enough if you not have making a big difference so there's sort of a trade off and very much a business hat on this issue of 
which of these six issues should we work on today? Should we work on the short term versus long term? Um, and how do you know you're being effective? Uh, but the cause you pick is driven by the heart. But even in that, which of the things that tugs at your heart should you work on? Because there are always too many. Yeah, and in and, and thinking about that, um, you know, and, as somebody who's born and raised in, in India, living uh, in the United States uh, uh, after, after college and, and for most of your life, but really being, you know, intertwined between both worlds, are there areas that you think are uh, particularly important in terms of the for philanthropy? And I'd love to hear if you notice any difference between India and, and the United States as you think about that context? Well, when you look at the US, I think our level of uh, resources is far, far higher than in India. Uh, but uh, there are still the same issues there's structural issues, which are always longer term issues. Uh, and inequality is the one that's surfaced the most in the current context, uh, but it's a long term issue. There's no short term solutions that we can do over the next three months uh, for that. Um, and then there's very short term issues and the organizations like the Red Cross and all in after a hurricane or a land, land, um, landslide or a fire is very good at addressing. Uh, I personally tended to focus on the structural longer term issues versus the symptomatic issues. The consequences of a fire are most felt by people uh, who, who don't have resources and that's the underlying structural issue. The symptomatic issue is there was a fire and people are homeless. You need to address both. Um, the short, uh, so uh, you have to address both, but I do think my personal preference is for the structural longer term issues. So uh, uh, I've always had a, tendency towards the long-term solutions, not the short-term solutions. I do say the short-term, and COVID is a great example, uh, adds urgency and adds more awareness and, uh, and, and empathy for the situation. Um, so, uh, I, you know, one of my hopes of the, from the COVID crisis is we both recognize new issues and some of the underlying issues, and we add new scientific tools to go address other crises, to measure crises and to address crises. So. Yeah, maybe pulling on that thread a, a little bit, you know, as, as we confront the rapidly uh, evolving landscape in terms of the, the impact of, of COVID, you know, you uh, have approached uh, Pretty much every every problem, at least as I'm far I'm aware, you know, from an approach of of systems change and and thinking about longer term and the role that technology and and innovation can can play, um, you know, across a, a number of different needs for society. When we have a crisis like this, it it tends to present um, you know some extraordinary challenges, but with that opportunities that that really do cry out for innovative solutions, whether it's accelerating, you know, something that people have been thinking about uh, significantly or causing us to, to adapt in a, in a very different way. And you've, you've written about this um, uh, topic, you know, I'm curious if there are areas that you've seen that, that excite you and, and give you a sense of optimism in terms of how, whether it is for sort of the most immediate response to COVID, but even building past the response and into uh, recovery and resiliency and, and really beyond that in terms of 
challenges that that the world faced pre-COVID and and will face hopefully uh, you know when we not too long when we're we're out of this immediate situation. What what gives you a sense of of hope or optimism or at least motivation in terms of of where innovation might be able to drive some some lasting change? So um, I'm 65. After I turned 60, I decided I'd spend the next uh, 25 years of my life working on a singular large issue, uh, health permitting. Of course, health is one thing one can never plan on. Um, <clears throat> but being today relatively healthy, I focus on the problem of 700 million people on the planet have a very rich lifestyle. It's rich in energy, it's rich in housing, it's rich in education, it's rich in access to healthcare, to entertainment, all kinds of transportation, we drive good cars, all kinds of services. <clears throat> uh, sorry, 7 billion people want it. And given my focus on sustainability for the last 20 years, uh, I always wondered how you do that. And for the next 25 years of my life, I decided to work on this problem of multiplying accessibility of services by 10x while reducing in absolute terms the amount of resources needed to provide it. Steel, uh, teachers, doctors, cement, you, uh, you, you name it. Almost all parts of the GDP are focused on some need that us humans have and 7 billion people want it at a decent acceptable level. Uh, and how do you do that? In my personal view, and this is pre-COVID, was the only way to do it is multiply resources with technology. Could you make a building with one fifth amount of material and make the space twice as efficient? Most buildings are empty most of the time, if you think about it. So um, that was pre-COVID. Now, what COVID has done is very interesting. First, it's proven how much we assume about what we can and cannot do. And I often say, we as people are limited, not by what we can do, but what, by what we think we can do. Um, we thought vaccine development took 10 years and now it might be 10 months. Uh, we thought medicine took a face-to-face -face visit with a doctor. Now we generally acknowledge it doesn't need to. So certain areas have been highlighted by COVID, pharma, ph pharmaceutical development. I think all of healthcare will be dramatically accepted. I wrote a document about six years ago saying the only way to make medicine higher quality is to make it 10x cheaper. And that means much more accessible. So. Uh, it was 10 years ago I first wrote about why the world should really have AI doctors and AI tutors. Somebody mentioned education in the last panel. Uh, it is the only way every child can have personalized education and it be affordable. It is the only way. It's the only way every mo mother in every village in India can have 24 seven access to primary care when a child needs care at 3 a.m., I can rush to the Stanford emergency room um, and don't care about the cost. That's not an option for most people. Um, so I think certain areas, healthcare, education, uh, are, are things that have been highlighted. We've gained certain tools. We've realized how much more we can do remotely. And so that may impact transportation. So I'm very, very excited that at least in a few narrow domains, the world has accelerated adoption of the assumptions around education and healthcare and, and pharmaceutical development and a few related things. That's very optimistic for me. I think that will survive COVID 
and we will learn how to do uh, find antibody treatments to any infection within months, not decades. For example, we will learn how to do AI-based medicine at almost no cost for everybody who has a cell phone. So I, I am very, very optimistic about what technology can do structurally. And uh, I've always believed that, but I think in certain areas, we will accelerate this. About three years ago, I wrote a large document. It's about 50 pages on reinventing societal infrastructure with technology. I'd say about three of the 10 areas are deeply accelerated now. And that's a real advantage we should gain from the crisis, the unfortunate crisis we are in today. In, in, it's always helpful to have uh, some optimism, but to see some, some tangible examples. Can I, can, of, can I uh, add one more talk? Yeah, please. You know, uh, so we've known for decades that pandemics are possible. In fact, in the late 90s, in the venture capital business I was involved, we actually started a venture fund focused mm -hmm. on pandemics in the late 90s at Kleiner Perkins when I was there. <clears throat> but nobody paid attention. Now, there's another large looming crisis that differentially affects the bottom 3 billion people on the planet, and that's climate change. And I hope we get smart enough to learn it is as important, maybe a much larger crisis, and that we need to address it. And not, that's not one we can address in months. So we have to have the technology development focus now to solve something that will affect a lot of people and, frankly, um, dramatically affect the people with the least resources. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, no, I actually, it's it, the direction I wanted to go and in, in building on that, you know, there, there's so many things that have been, I guess, a, a wake up call uh, for the world. Uh, you know, you were working on this 20 years ago in terms of pandemics. I work at the Gates Foundation and you've probably seen, you know, Bill and uh, his uh, approach, Bill Gates and his approach to this, you know, particularly the TED talk that he gave a few years ago, warning of this and, you know, uh, these are extraordinary challenges, but but I think it's it's fair to say uh, across the board we could have been better prepared and and still respond better. And so, in addition to the technology innovation and and adaptation, what else do you think would help us so that you know we as a society and we can put this in a global context in a U.S. or in an India context, but what around society needs to evolve so that we collectively are, are better prepared to meet challenges like this and, and pull together versus get, get pulled apart in different directions? Well, the global challenge is very hard. We are seeing this in the tension between Russia and the US, US and China. And frankly, it's unfortunate with our administration uh, there's a natural tendency to try and bully our way out of things, which is very unfortunate uh, with the current administration. Um, so uh, that is unfortunate. I think it starts with empathy and it starts with recognizing that we are interdependent. It doesn't matter what we do if we, if we have people traveling, we are susceptible to pandemics everywhere uh, that start everywhere. So it's not just other people's problem, every problem spreads. Um, it's also shown, and that, that's true whether we are in the US or in uh, India or any Africa, you pick your location. Uh, the fundamental structural problem that it has surfaced for me is the problem of inequality and inequality and divisions in any way. And whenever we have them, some, somebody, likely a politician, will exploit them to create further divisions among us. You know, I think inequality, of course, is a huge problem in India but even the religious divisions, somehow people think a Muslim mother with 
the three-year-old child is different than a Hindu mother with a three-year-old child. And that division will be exploited by people over time in their self-interest. So we have to re remove all ideas of inequality or division. And we've seen this happen in the Mideast. The Sunnis and Muslims used to live happily together for centuries, and then people chose to divide them. And now it's a battle and it's a permanent problem. Uh, there was never an issue uh, for, for a long time. Uh, so I do think at the heart of it, we have to go after first these artificial divisions. Uh, and that starts when children are very young. And we can't solve that problem when somebody is 55. We have to solve it when they're five years old with what they see, what they learn, how they are taught about this notion of divisions and inequality. And frankly, I think people with the most empathy tend to be the happiest people. They care. Um, and, and that's something we can teach people on uh, very early. So I hope we teach very early to the very young caring and equality and, and, and the need for different points of view. And the point of view could be religious or liberal or democratic or Republican or pick your favorite. Yeah, uh, so. I mean, it's, I mean, it's fascinating. So, so really the, the combination of, of empathy on an individual level and innovation on a societal level, if you, if you can combine those, um, you know, there's there's strong reason for for optimism going forward. Yeah, I, I do think uh, that there's a funny thing. I think empathy is key to caring and philanthropy. But to be efficacious, I recommend people read a book called Against Empathy on mm -hmm. why what you do uh, and how you do it. You can't use empathy. You have to use your rational business sense. So I recommend anybody interested in for, of empathy, read this book called Against Empathy. Too, because then you can have the most, make the most difference for the people you care about the most. No, that's, that, that's great. Obviously, it's, it's a complex endeavor in terms of, of driving change for society. Maybe one last question from me, and then we'll see if we can take some from the audience. Um, you and, and Nero joined the, the Giving Pledge in, in 2000. 11, and I, I just welcome any comments on the experience in terms of uh, being part of the pledge, working with other philanthropists, and I guess, you know, sort of a, a very open-ended question, but what do you think it takes to get others to recognize the incredible impact that they can have by using their resources, you know, financial resources, their ideas, their voice to drive meaningful change? Well, so... Uh... You know, the Giving Pledge is interesting, and I'm really, really appreciative of uh, Bill, Bill and Melinda and Warren Buffett uh, when they first approached me. It was a very small group. There was maybe a dozen, dozen uh, people we had dinner with uh, here in Silicon Valley. And I had always thought of philanthropy I could do later or worry about later or think about later. And what the Giving Pledge catalyzed is worrying about it now and thinking about it now. Uh, the regular Giving Pledge meetings we have uh, do two things for me. One, they bring it to the fore every year and I have to sit down and, and for the next month or two, it's frontline in my brain uh, as opposed to one of the things of the 20 things I have to think about. So it is very valuable to be part of it. Uh, the surprising thing is I think it really changes the value system of the family. Uh, what I would say to everybody who'd consider giving, it actually improves both happiness and value systems and teaches your kids and family how to think about things very differently than what's in it for me, what's the right business decision, how can I make more money? 
Um, so that's very, very uh, useful and, and frankly, pretty selfish. You'll feel better participating in philanthropy and really better caring about other people and things that are wrong in the world. Um, the other thing that's uh, very valuable here is to realize how many different things that we hadn't even thought about as problems are there to work on. I still remember early on meeting the, a couple that was working on child trade. And I never thought of that as a scale problem. And then I realized how large a problem it was by talking to them and uh, learning from them. So there's a real learning opportunity of the number of things that need addressing. So I'm uh, looking through some of the chat of the, the questions that came in and we're, we're approaching the, the end of our time. So I'm gonna um, uh, take just a, a one or two here. Um, you know, one was, it, it's combining a couple questions in some way, which is you know, sort of thinking about your role as a venture capitalist and, and also as an investor and, and a philanthropist. And it, sort of broadly, I think the sense of it was, it, given the challenges that society has, does capitalism still work? Do we need to evolve beyond it? Do you, where, do you, where do you stand on, on, on sort of the, the larger question? Well, capitalism is efficient. And it's good at uh, making whatever you decide to work on efficient when capitalism can address it. Capitalism is not good at picking the right goals for society. The most obvious example is the whole goal of every capitalist marketeer is to sell you stuff you don't need. To get you to click on links, to take advertising, to want things you never knew you wanted. And that capital was good in production efficiency a hundred years ago. Capitalism, capitalism is not at good, as good at demand generate when, when it focuses on demand generation, not meeting demands. Um, so I do think we need modified capitalism. I do think we need the efficiency of capitalism. But much more importantly, the goals of capitalism have to be much more focused on inequality. Uh, and I think inequality, whether it's between Hindus and Muslims in India or certain ethnic races in the US, it's becoming one of the largest social problems the world will face the next two decades. It's the one that I think is the most dangerous problem to have because it can be explosive. It's tinder for the wrong people to exploit. Um, so I do think we need a different kind of capitalism. I do think uh, we need to modify it in many ways. And in, uh, I, I'd add one more last point. As we move to more sophisticated technologies, say AI physicians, are, we've seen this with all the big tech companies and uh, with AI generally, it will increase inequality. About five years ago, I wrote a long piece in Forbes on how AI will cause GDP growth. It will cause productivity growth. All the traditional metrics economists use for the health of an economy. It will improve all those dramatically. And the title said, and rising inequality. That cannot happen because democracy, the world we love, is by permission of, uh, sorry, capitalism is by permission of democracy. Right. And democracy and democratic process can revoke capitalistic rights. And the world will lose a tool. But we have to keep in mind, capitalism is a tool, not an end goal. Uh, and so I, ho I hope uh, we realize this and start to modify capitalism with other goals, not just production efficiency. And inequality is probably the highest goal we ought to go after with, well, I'll say, modifications to capitalism. 
I could talk about that for hours. Yeah, no, it's it's excellent. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm getting the the ping that we're we're up, uh, at time. I, I, first off, just thank you for for. Uh, the two of us in the U.S. What an inspiring way to get a morning kicked off, and and uh, for those uh, joining in India, hopefully a, a really in- insightful portion of their evening. Let me turn it back to Pooja to wrap us up. Thanks a lot, both of you, for sharing your takes on what philanthropy looks like on ground um, in times of crisis, particularly in the COVID pandemic. Uh, your op- optimistic views. Uh, especially on human potential to ta- to tackle challenges and suggestions to improve struggling situations as well. I think uh, that was quite encouraging. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Khosla and Mr. Rossin for joining us in an engaging discussion.